Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Professor Hall and this is part two on our lecture series about the book Pachinko. Um, so last time we talked about what Pachinko is, um, which is a, a Japanese game of chance. We talked a little bit about the annexation and colonization of Korea by the Japanese. We talked about religion in the area and how uh, the, the growth of Christianity during this time uh, that the book takes place in. And then I gave you guys a little bit of, of a plot overview and we talked about point of view as well. So today we're talking about structure. We're going to talk a little bit about characterization and then we'll look at some of the major themes and symbols. So the importance of setting. As I stated in the first lecture and, and by now you've read a little bit, um, the there are several different settings in this book because it is an epic so it takes place over uh almost 90 years sorry over almost 80 years um from 1910 until 1989 um and so because of that, we have a number of different settings, but I wanted to give you guys just kind of a couple pictures here and pull them up. So this is the fishing, this is the fishing village that we start off with. Um, this picture I think is from around 1930. Um, so a little bit more developed than, than it would have been at the very beginning of the book, right when the annexation takes place. Um, and here it is today. So this is uh, Yongdo in Busan, uh, South Korea. And you can see that um, the industry there, uh, there are a number of things being built along the waterfront, but you can see that shipping still is uh, an important part of the culture. So basically the first part of our story takes place in this village and a lot of the important pieces here, there we go, are about village life. Even before we get into Japan, though, we really do have, and I'll talk about this more after the setting, but this is kind of, they all go together. Um, we have this idea of marginalized people. And the author really has stated a number of times that her intention with this book was to show the experiences of marginalized Koreans whose stories haven't been told before. Um, I think that this is really one of the reasons that I paired this with the book Crazy Rich Asians that you're also reading for this class is because that story is kind of the complete opposite. Um, in Crazy Rich Asians, we get the very wealthy people, um, again, sometimes whose stories haven't been told, but they're, uh, as the name implies, <laughs> exceedingly wealthy and doing very well in life. And these are the people who are kind of running things, right, in Singapore and um, in the other towns that they have houses in. But here, um, we have a very poor, impoverished kind of town, especially after the, the Japanese takeover, the annexation, and then the colonization. And we also have Huni, who, uh, as I mentioned before, he has a cleft palate, he has a twisted foot, so he walks with a limp. His wife is from a very poor family. And so you have this idea that these are stories that we may not have heard from other people, which I think is really interesting. Um, here's another view of the village today. Um, it really, you can see the beauty of it here, I think, and how everybody has built up to, to be able to see the, the beautiful view. So the next setting, especially into part two of the book, in part two, the characters um, of uh, Sunja and her husband, Isak, they have um, her child through Hansu, who uh, is named Noah and adopted by Isak. And then um, Sunja and Isak have another child, Mazazu. So they go to live in Japan. This is part of Osaka. And this is 
the you can see here it says Koreatown, but really in the book it's essentially a ghetto. So the people who are Koreans who are coming to live in Japan are looked down upon because they're immigrants, and much like immigrants in the United States are often looked down upon, and immigrants to European countries are often looked down upon, um, and again seen as lesser than. So Japan has taken Korea over. Some Koreans have moved to Japan seeking um, better lives for themselves. And many of them are in these ghettos um, where they're kind of, they're not really given the opportunities for housing in other sections and other areas, basically. So the setting here, again, we had before some physical difficulties. Now we have a woman who had a child out of wedlock. We have a Christian preacher who's Isak, her husband. Um, at this point, again, not many Christians and, and the Christians are there are being persecuted. We have um, the two people that they are living with. All of these people are immigrants, so they're marginalized in a variety of ways. Also, the ghetto is not safe. Um, the two women, um, Sunja and then her, her friend who she ends up living with, um, the of the couple that, that Sunja and Isaac live with, um, the women are encouraged like not to go out. They don't want people to know that they live there. They don't want people really knowing anything about them um, because of the robberies and things like that that have been taking place. So that is our second setting. Our uh, next, oh, our next thing that I wanted to talk to you about is some, <laughs> they just really want you to pay for this. Sorry. Um, so the next thing that I want to talk about is just, again, the variety of settings here. We do have some smaller villages. We also have some larger metropolises. And by this point, we're in the 1930s, 1940s. And I just wanted to show you guys some of these pictures to get a taste of what life was like. Um, a newspaper vendor. We have this very interesting mix at this point of the old and the new. Um, so you'll see in some of these pictures, um, there we go. Um, these are two geishas who are um, in a traditional dress and in the flower market. You can see there are, uh, looks like one here and then two here. And then we also have um, trolley system going through. We have movie posters and for the cinema. Um, we also have people who, um, are, I'm going to just go past that picture. Sorry about that. Um, these are some, some people in contemporary dress, but there's one, some of these are just artistic. Here we go. You can see the traditional, um, here and here and then other people in more western clothes and so as the caption says um if you can read it the the western influences as the war um as world war ii became more heated uh the western influences were really looked down upon so you had a lot of people returning to the the old um traditional styles of dressing and and certainly in our book um in our book the idea of clothing is quite important and i don't think i have it listed among the symbols because there's really more of a motif a motif is a repeating element that just keeps kind of coming up that you should kind of take notice of. Um, the Korean characters really try to dress in a Japanese style at different points to fit in with the culture to which they are trying to um, assimilate to, basically. So we have a lot of that going on. And here's a pachinko parlor from this is i think in the 1960s so we have um i don't want to give too much away but one of the characters ends up working uh in a pachinko parlor and again this idea that it's about chance and fate but also there's this very um sad 
idea that people keep trying to find their fortune and keep trying to win and they'll get like a little bit of a payout and then all their money will be gone and then a little bit of a payout. So there's these little things that kind of keep pulling them in, right, to make them want to gamble more and more. And it's very um, symbolic of the way that they're living their lives as well. We also see a lot of corruption in these pachinko parlors. So um, if you've ever seen a movie about a casino in the United States, it's, it's not that much different in other countries that people are taking money off the top. People are trying to rig the machines to not pay out. Um, so that they won't have, uh, they'll have bigger profits and, and things of that nature. So you're going to see different characters kind of struggling with that. So those are some of the settings in the book. And really, the importance of setting has a lot to do with who is marginalized, who is being focused on in each chapter, um, in each section, and how are they trying to find better fates for themselves and to, to kind of make their fortune. We have Noah who learns of his parentage and, um, and his, his finds out about his real father and really tries to become Japanese to the extent that he's able to. We have, um, the other son, Mazazu working in a pachinko parlor, trying to make his fortune. We have another character later on in the book who is, um, involved in sex work, essentially, and then um, uh, falls victim to AIDS. And so all of these types of ways that people are marginalized through disability, through um, their appearance, through the fact that they're a different race or a different nationality than, than the, you know, the majority, through the fact that they are immigrants, through the fact, this is a big one, through the fact that they are um, poor and they're, they really have um, no money. So this kind of brings us into some of our major themes. And I don't have, I don't know why that's way over there. <laughs> I don't have this first, but I'll talk about it first. The idea of wealth and poverty, some characters are quite wealthy, particularly Hansu, the father of Noah, the biological father of Noah. Other people are in incredibly impoverished and they do different things to try to bring themselves out of that poverty. Um, the women are encouraged not to work and they start to uh, try to sell traditional Korean foods to the Korean people in their area uh, in the ghetto that we just kind of looked at a, a little bit ago. We have people who are wealthy kind of trying to control others and tell them how to live their lives. Um, and again, th this kind of ties into both power dynamics and the idea of racism and discrimination. Because in this book, racism, discrimination, and wealth are very intricately connected. So I want you to kind of look at that because as I, I talked about last time, you know, the Japanese ethnographers of the time um, were trying to portray the Korean people in a certain way as being um, lazy, as being unclean, um, diseased, those types of things. And, and having said that, the annexation, the colonization um, that came about essentially without a war caused <laughs> problems with sanitation, problems with disease, problems with, with money and with, with economics, um, taking over their land, all of these things. So what you basically have is a colonizing country causing the problems that they then say are there. And I think what's interesting is that you see this play out in this very small level um, in a domestic situation with all of these different families, uh, part of the, the larger family that we're following through many generations. So I want you really, as you're reading, to think about the things that are going on in the background, but also to think about, um, you know, to what extent do chance and fate play a role in this? And to what extent is it you know, people's choices and what they're, what they're choosing to do, the choices that they're, that they're making. Um, religion and faith, we talked about a little bit last time. 
Isak in particular is really being driven by his faith. He's also suffering from tuberculosis. So his, um, his kind of idea in his mind is that he doesn't have a long time on the earth and he wants to do things, um, in order to, um, to do good in the world before he goes and to kind of honor God in that way. There are uh, a number of literary references. So I should put this in here as I'm talking. Um, allusions are references to basically things outside the text, outside of the book, things that are well known. So in this book, we have a number of biblical illusions particularly this is a lot of arrows but particularly to hosea so um to explain briefly um in the bible there is a book about a man named hosea who basically marries a loose woman who is a prostitute and having affairs and he talks to God about how to forgive her. And he keeps taking this woman back into his life and forgiving her over and over and over again as her husband. And so, um, Isak is intrigued by this idea and falls in love with Sunja, but also wants to take care of her and wants to be a great man of God like Hosea. And so he decides to marry her, even though um, physically they have not been together yet, but she is pregnant with another man's child. And so um, it's a very important point in the book, the decisions that he's making and um, the decisions that she made and the way that his faith kind of drives that decision. Later on, we see the persecution of Isak and a few others when they decide to... Um, not bow to the authorities and instead he's saying uh, the Lord's Prayer, which is uh, a piece from the Bible of prayer that he's saying to God and repeating over and over and over. And so he's imprisoned for that. So the, the thing here, and I don't remember at this moment if I'm having you guys read Crazy Rich Asians before or after this book, but in that book um, and in a few others that we're going to read, um, I'm thinking of the memoir that we're reading later on in the class. We have faith as kind of this peripheral thing that either people are religious where they they go to church and they do the appearance of things or um, as in the case with First They Killed My Father, we have someone who kind of has a vague idea of faith and like maybe there's a God, maybe not. This book is really incredibly different, and um, I want you really to to examine his character in particular um, and the choices that he's making because of his faith and, and whether or not those are sound choices for, um, for his life and whether or not he's actually doing the right thing. Gender roles and expectations play a huge role in part two of the book. So... Part one, we do have a little bit of this um, with Sunja having sexual relations before being married and then later on realizing the, the truth about the man that she's with, Hansu. But really in part two, as we move into Japan, we find um, two characters, Yoseb, who is Isak's brother, and Kiyongi, who is Yoseb's wife. And Sunja, Isak... Noah, and then later, later Mazasu are living with this family. So they so far have been, un, when we meet them, unable to have children. But Yoseb really has very distinct ideas about what women should do and what men should do. And this comes into play, and especially when looking at um, issues of money and who is going to be making money? How is this family going to survive? And, you know, I think that there is this idea that is tossed around a lot um, in, in the U.S. that women were not allowed to have jobs and, and that women never worked. 
and uh, that, you know, up until maybe 1970, when we have the second wave of feminism and, and that kind of thing. The truth is that women of a certain rank and social station did not have to work. But most women in poverty, I won't say most, but many in women in poverty did work to try to help uh, the family survive. So domestic service, um, working as a, a maid, for example, um, we have in in Britain, in Victorian times, if you've ever read My Fair Lady, you have women who are selling flowers or um, selling wares on the streets and street markets and that kind of thing. And so the women of this story decide that they want to help their family and, and help to support their family um, and help to educate their chil the children that are living with them. And basically, Kiyongi becomes kind of a second mother to Sunja's children and becomes like a sister to Sunja herself. So I do want you to look for that, especially in the second part of the book, to kind of see what are the roles and expectations of this culture and how do the women kind of fit into those patterns in some ways and how do they try to kind of buck against them in other ways. We have biological and non-biological families. Um, I just mentioned um, Kiyongi basically becoming uh, like a second mother. We have Isak who adopts Noah. And so, uh, you know, I put this as a theme. I think it's, again, it's probably really more of a motif, but just something to look at. Who are the biological families? Who are the non-biological families? What do family ties mean um, in this culture and to these people? And also, when are they important and when are they not important? Sometimes loyalty and love of a non-biological family means much more than the blood ties of a biological one. So um, how do the, the fathers, the two fathers in particular, um, Isak and Hansu, how are they fathers or how are they not? So that's something to look for. Education is going to be something that's incredibly important to... Again, over. Um, education is incredibly important to the characters. Education in Korea, and I guess to a certain extent Japan, um, is still incredibly important. Um, they have this idea coming from Confucianism of like a right way of thinking and a right way of doing things. And so education kind of permeates into a number of different areas of life. People who are educated are more respected. People who are not educated, again, are kind of marginalized and pushed to the side. So um, tie that back into the idea of marginalization and power dynamics, wealth and poverty and discrimination, because education is kind of tied to all of those things. And who is getting an education and who is not? So, very briefly, um, a few symbols. I'm not going to go through all of them. There are some more in your study guide, but a few symbols to kind of look for. The cleft lip of uh, Huni in the first, uh, the first part of our book, again, kind of symbolizing um, poverty, a lot of... Um, Cleft lip isn't something we see a lot in the West it, it, because it, it can be corrected. But in um, impoverished countries, that's something that gets seen a little bit more in children because it's not as easily correctable um, if you don't have proper medical care. But it doesn't really um, affect people really that much. It just is, is something that makes you look a little bit different. So that and his... Um, his limp and, and his physical disability with his leg really do separate him from a very early age. Having said that, the separation seems to be in some ways a positive one because it, it seems to make him a, a, a better, kinder person. And certainly then he, he finds a wife who is as kind as he is. Kimchi in the second... Um, so the cleft lip at any rate... Uh, symbolizes that division. Um, that's what it is. It's a division and it, it's something that divides and separates this family from all of the other families and all the other people that they're going to be living with. The kimchi really comes up more in the second part of our book. 
Um, so it's a, it symbolizes a way for women to make money. It symbolizes the, the food and the, the life of people who are from Korea kind of still trying to hold on to that, even in this new country that they're living in. In contrast to that, we have Japanese food. So biscuits, which only a few people can afford. Sushi, which is a little bit fancier. Um, a lot of the people from Korea are just eating plain rice. They're not having, um, they're they're not having things prepared the way that the Japanese people are. So again, um, you know, food is so intimately tied to culture, and I want you to kind of think about the ways that people are accepting or rejecting different cultures based on what they're eating, and. Um, and how they're um, they're still trying to hold on to pieces of their culture. The Lord's Prayer um, basically is symbolizing again Isaac's. Um, I almost said Huni. Um, Isaac's devotion um, to God, even in the face of possible persecution, and is another thing that kind of shows that um, unlike the pachinko machines that we kind of already talked about. This has much more to do with trusting um, God to take care of you and, and to provide, as the prayer says, your daily bread, um, whether that be spiritual or physical, as opposed to the pachinko machines where you're trying to win money and control your fate and it's it's still up to, to chance for the most part. Um, so it's a different way of looking at the world, I think, and that is very much with Isaac's character, given some of his choices. So I hope that you have a little bit of a better understanding about the book uh, going into it, and um, I also uh, hope that you enjoy it, and I can't wait to see your discussions on it. Thanks, everybody.